We're here with a former U.S. ambassador to Israel, David Friedman. Uh, David, you know, what's your thoughts here? We're 27 days in, into the war. How do you think uh, Israel's handling things? I think within uh, Israel domestically, I think it's been uh, extraordinary, really, really, really impressive, uplifting. Um, uh, I'm, I'm amazed, first of all, at the unity uh, and uh, devotion that the Israeli people have for each other. Um, the the amounts of uh, kindness, the, the 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 chesed, you know, the the outpouring of of people just wanting to help and do whatever they can to help and to help each other and to help the displaced people from the north and the south, to help the soldiers, to help the first responders. I mean, it's it's amazing. It's really amazing. Something I've never seen before. And obviously, I've been following Israel and, and been there many many times. I think the soldiers as well are doing incredibly well. I mean, they are now. You know, as as they report inside, uh, deeply inside of Gaza, they're engaged in in incredibly challenging uh, combat operations. Um, regrettably, I think that there's there's been some you know heavy losses. Uh, Sixteen, I think, is the latest count. Um, but you know that's that's uh, you know a deep wound uh, in Israel. Anytime a single soldier dies, but they're doing they're doing incredible work. They're really plowing through Gaza, and I think doing something that, you know, needed to be done, uh, probably needed to be done earlier, but certainly needed to be done. And um, I, with God's help, you know, they will eradicate Hamas. And, uh, you know, with, with a lot of God's help, maybe the Gaza Strip can be rebuilt in a way that's not threatening to Israel. Current U.S. President Joe Biden has made many statements of support uh, on behalf of Israel and its right to defend itself, its uh, right and responsibility to dismantle Hamas and to take it out as the governing uh, body in the Gaza Strip. They've also sent two uh, major aircraft carrier groups over to the Middle East, uh, and we've seen other uh, other ships being used to shoot down uh, missiles that are being shot at Israel from Yemen. You know, how would you grade America's response to the conflict so far? I think the military response is an A. Uh, you know, the, for all the reasons you just said, I think uh, both in actual defense and in deterrent effect, uh, been very important. It's been very important, and and I was very grateful for that. Um, the politics are starting to ooze into the calculus now. Uh, Twenty seven days into the war with more, um, with civilian loss of life, um, with an election coming up with um, people like uh, Pramila Jayapal, the Congresswoman from the far West and the far left, who, you know, uh, refused to join in that, you know, overwhelming majority uh, in Congress that stood with Israel and opposed Hamas. She refused to join that resolution, even though 420 of her colleagues did. Now she's saying publicly that if Biden doesn't start pivoting more closely uh, away from Israel and towards the uh, Muslim community, he's going to lose the election. So what happens yesterday, Kamala Harris makes an announcement of a new uh, uh, task force that's being formed to combat, of all things, Islamophobia. Now, I I I'm in no way in favor of Islamophobia, don't, don't get me wrong, but we're, in a, we're living in a time right now where the Jewish people constitute 2% of the population of the United States, and they're on the receiving end of more than 60% of the religious-based hate crimes. So um, uh, while uh, I have no problem with combating Islamophobia, uh, it's pretty tone deaf and exactly the wrong thing that she should have said yesterday, except if they were politicizing the conflict, which, you know, we were above politics for the first few days, but unfortunately right now we're not. And I hope that it doesn't get worse in that respect. Uh, this past weekend, uh, former President Donald Trump, whose administration you worked for, said at the Republican Jewish Coalition in his uh, keynote address that this never would have happened uh, under his watch. Could you uh, talk back to the time in which you were the uh, U.S. ambassador to Israel and, and why you think that the uh, situation was generally calmer and, and safer both for Israelis and Palestinians while you were here? I think it starts and, and maybe it even ends with Iran. I mean, because I think Iran is the head of the snake and Iran is driving all of these activities, whether uh, it's it's Hamas or it's Hezbollah or it's the Houthis now declaring war you know, on Israel or it's the attacks against America coming out of in Iraq and Syria, 28 attacks against American soldiers. I think it all comes from Iran. And our Iran policy was just, you know, overwhelmingly better than the Biden policy. I mean, we had Iran virtually bankrupt. You know, our sanctions were, were crippling. 
today, there's almost no sanctions of uh, meaningful sanctions on Iran. They're selling 50, 60 billion dollars of oil every year to Russia and China. We don't do anything about it. Um, we, um, you know, we uh, we acted against Qasem Soleimani, who was, you know, the single greatest uh, um, uh, advocate for terror and sponsor of terror against American interest. He had already uh, directed the uh, the killing of American uh, citizens and was about to do more. And um, and I think that you know Trump was just you know uh, unequivocal in in his strength and his determination not to allow uh, Islamic extremism. Uh, you know, get the better of, of of America or its allies. And by the way, he he encouraged um, you know the Saudis and Emiratis and many many Muslim countries to to join in. And ultimately, that was that was how we got to the Abraham Accords because of this willingness that these countries had to trust America, you know, to act as a force of good within the world and to protect the Middle East. It's all gone right now, and you see how in such a short period of time, because the Middle East is so volatile, in such a short period of time. That's all flipped, and it's primarily because of our policies on Iran, and uh, and as it relates to places like uh, you know in Israel, Hamas or Hezbollah. Look, we made it very clear: if Israel is attacked, there'll be no limitations placed on Israel by the United States of any kind, limiting Israel's ability to respond. We trust Israel. We believe they know how to respond. We believe that they are inherently uh, reliable to to not target civilians and to minimize civilian casualties. We said, look, if Israel's attacked, we're going to support Israel and we're going to help them defend themselves, period. You know, no discussion, ceasefires, humanitarian or otherwise, just, you know, Israel will do the job it needs to do. And I think that Israel's enemies recognize that. And I think that uh, is 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 likely the reason why during the Trump administration, we didn't have any new wars. And, and uh, Israel, uh, I think, enjoyed four years, uh, four of the quietest years in its history. And you think that that's a little bit different than the type of uh, political support that Israel's receiving from the Biden administration? Yeah, the political support is different. The military support, I said, I give it an A. The political support, you know, I think it started at around a, a B plus and it's starting to, you know, shrink down to, uh, you know, to a C or a C minus. Look, there's this talk about, you know, about a ceasefire, you know, and and, and to their credit, you know, uh, Biden and, and his uh and those that work for him are saying there shouldn't be a ceasefire. Then there's talk about a humanitarian pause, right? It, it's the same thing, okay? I mean, this is not the time to be, you know, dealing in semantics. We got to be absolutely clear. You know, there's been pressure put on Israel by the Biden administration to sell oil or to give oil, let oil into the Gaza Strip. I think I think Israel, you know, accepts the the, the wishes of the Biden administration. They probably would have done it on their own with regard to, to food and, and medicine. But not 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 fuel. Like fuel is what Hamas needs to prosecute this war. They needed to ventilate their tunnels. They needed to launch their rockets. All right, and you know all the fuel that comes in, you know, is going to be taken by Hamas. I mean, there is absolutely no way that any human humanitarian agency within the Gaza Strip can direct the fuel to non-lethal means. And so, but that pressure is there. Again, it's not because. Of anything but politics they're they're starting to think about the election they're starting to think about states like michigan you know which has a large muslim population which is a which is a swing state and you know they're they're, they're pushing israel uh not for any legitimate reason not for a real humanitarian reason but just for a political reason and and, and that's it's starting to move in that direction that's really unfortunate what did the number one uh, policy with regard to humanitarian issues be to get the Rafa border open and to let refugees that want to get out of the Strip leave? I mean, we've seen it happen in Ukraine and every other war zone in the world when when there's a war going on and people want to leave, that there should be a humanitarian corridor. Is the United States pushing and should the United States be pushing to allow uh, refugees to leave the Strip? Yeah, we should be pushing with uh, with Egypt. But, you know, look, Egypt, e Egypt knows knows this population well, right? I mean, Egypt was in control of the Gaza Strip from 48 to 67. They know the population well. They know it is a radicalized population. Uh, Egypt has its own problems with, with the Muslim Brotherhood, which is the, the local analog of Hamas. And, and they don't want to let anybody in. Uh, they, don't, they don't think that there is a, a non-threatening Gazan uh, to their own interest. I understand that. I think it could be mitigated, meaning I think there could be you know, um, uh, tent cities, if you will, established in Sinai, far enough from Egyptian population centers, which could be controlled. But Egypt doesn't want to do it. 
Also, and, uh, also yeah. refugees don't need to stay in Egypt, right? They need to go through the border, but they could be resettled elsewhere. I mean, even in the Ukraine war, Israel took uh, 35,000 refugees from the Ukraine. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, not surprisingly, again, because this is such a radicalized population, there are no countries out there that um, that want to accept any uh, any of the Gazan population. Part of it is they don't want them. Part of it is those that are hostile to Israel see this as a as a pressure point that will cause Israel to you know give up its battle faster. But it won't. It's not going to have any effect. Right. It kind of boomerangs on Israel. You mentioned the uh, Abraham Accords. Um, can you tell me, you know, what role you think that the Abraham Accords had in uh, propelling this conflict, causing it, and what you think the effects of this conflict might be on the Accords? Well, the Accords were getting ready to expand, I think, to Saudi Arabia. And I think that was a major, major uh, point of friction and threat to Iran. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, Iran looks at Saudi Arabia standing alone as uh a country they can they can bully uh, with uh, with an alignment with Israel and the United States it becomes a much different calculation. So I think a, a large part of this was was the uh, concerns about uh, the Abraham Accords extending to Saudi Arabia. By the way, while, while I was watching those discussions before the war, I was thinking to myself, why in the world are they talking about this? You know, why are they discussing normalization with Saudi Arabia? It hasn't happened yet. It's in the early stages. Why is this on the table? I mean, is Biden trying to score some political points? I don't know. But it was when I heard that, I said, this isn't going to go anywhere, because if you put this on the table before it's done, you're giving too many people a chance to shoot at it. Look, you remember um, our first uh, Abraham Accord country was United Arab Emirates. We announced it on August 13th of 2020 in the Oval Office. I was there, part of the announcement. We shocked the world. Nobody, nobody in America, nobody in UAE, nobody around the world knew it was coming. And that was because we trusted each other, we kept it quiet. And, and that's how it got done. With Saudi Arabia, they were, they're talking about it and taking credit for it and speaking about it, you know, long before it had ever gotten to a point of, uh, of being actualized. So that, that alone was, you know, I thought a huge tactical error, you know, probably among, among America and Israel, by the way. Um, where's it going now? The Saudis, you know, met with uh, the Americans this past week. Um, the fact that they came, the fact that they met, the fact that they talked about about you know the region um um i i think that opportunity is still there um uh, the uae came out with an announcement this week that the abraham accords are here to stay you know bahrain different country um much more serious domestic issues they pulled their ambassador today um i think they're declaring sort of a pause on the abraham accords but We've they'll heard go back conflicting here. reports actually as to whether that's uh that's an accurate uh, accurate okay. report well, I hope I hope it I hope it's not true. But if it is, I think it's you know a function of some you know immediate domestic issues that I think will 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 self correct in time. So I think the Abraham Accords are are going to continue to to go forward. I think Israel's ability to decisively defeat Hamas is an essential ingredient in advancing the Abraham Accords. All these countries are rooting for Israel deep down. They may not come out and say it, but Hamas and its and its allies are the enemies of all these countries as well. What do you think could be the effects if uh, Israel somehow doesn't come out with a decisive victory on the accords? And I don't even want to think about it. I, I think I think that's such a bad outcome that I just have I have too much confidence in the Israeli people to demand um, a decisive outcome. I think they will not tolerate anything less, and um, and I'm going to just assume that that's where we're going to end up. That's certainly the path we're on now. And I'm going to uh, continue to to think and pray that that's where we end up. And what do you think needs to happen next in the next uh, 7, 14, 30 days? It's a military operation. I'm not a military expert. I see what they're doing. I, th I think, you know, that continuing to kind of split the territory, um, you know, kill terrorists, degrade their capabilities, destroy the terror tunnels, um, move civilians out of harm's way as much as possible, and continue to kind of um, you know, kind of divide and conquer, divide and conquer is, is, a, good, is a good strategy. They, again, the, the, the combination of ground forces, air forces, sea, AI, um, intelligence, it seems to be working very well. And uh, I just think that has to continue. I, I, I don't think they're done. I mean, they've made a lot of progress, but I don't think they're done. I think they're, I, I'm, my sense, and again, I'm not a military expert, is that they're ahead of schedule, but I don't think they're anywhere close to being done. Have you been surprised by the, uh, 
lack of public support that Israel's received uh, in mainstream press and social media and even on places like university campuses in the United States, have you seeing the tide turn very quickly against Israel and towards uh, support for the Palestinian cause? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 shocking. It's shocking. I mean, let's let's start with with Russia. You, you know, we had a had a pogrom in Russia at the airport in the south. Um, riots in London and Paris with hundreds of thousands of people. 10,000 people in New York. College campuses are aflame with anti-Semitism. This is a serious issue. I mean, this is a really serious issue. And, and there are ways to combat it that are um, that, that we need to get involved in. We need to, number one, we need to. And I, I, I heard this yesterday, very disappointed in Secretary Mayorkas, because he just doesn't want to touch these issues that are essential. But he was asked, I remember, by, uh, by, by Congressman Hawley, you know, you, uh, you, you've given student visas to people that are now siding and aligning with a foreign terrorist organization as designated by the United States. Shouldn't you revoke their visas? But the answer should be a resounding yes. He didn't want to touch it. He, he, did, he wouldn't make any commitment to it at all, even on a moral basis, you know, whether it's legally appropriate. So we have real problems at key points in the administration. Um, I, I think there has been, you know, a significant infiltration into our country of, of foreigners that hate Israel and hate Jews. Um, I think we let them in, and I don't think we're doing anything right now to get them out. Um, I think university professors are uh, have done a, you know, collectively. I mean, there are lots of exceptions, but they have done a, a terrible job poisoning the minds of of our students. The better the school, the worse the indoctrination. You know, I'm a I'm a grad of uh, Columbia. And uh, and I'm seeing what's going on there now. I'm mortified by it. I'll never give them another penny. And um, and I think it's a uh, you know I, I think it's really disturbing. You know, as I said, sixty percent of the hate crimes are being directed at two percent of the population. Um, uh, it's it's it doesn't it doesn't bode well for the future of Jews in the diaspora. And uh, you know, what do you think? Uh, an Israeli decisive win could contribute to to that front. You know, the front for popular opinion, the front for the safety of Jews in America. I think Israel has to win for Israel. Um, I think uh, if Israel wins decisively, I think it will it will be far more respected within the region. I think it will have more opportunities to expand its normalization with more Arab countries. Um, I think the um, you know there'll be a street problem in places like Jordan and Egypt, which will eventually subside. But I think those are manageable. In America, look, you know, um, you know, we're, we're we're a tiny fraction of the American population. America is a great country. the The Constitution offers tremendous protections to to Jewish people. I think the vast majority of Americans um, not only are, are are against anti Semitism, but I think have are extremely welcoming and 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 friendly and and good to to Jewish people. But um, we got to focus on that, you know, that minority because it's growing. It's it's virulent. It's infected uh, college campuses where the future leaders of our country are coming from. And it only takes, you know, a few people. Look, it took uh, 18, 19, you know, uh, people to bring about 9-11 with with box cutters. So we need to be, you know, I think we need to be far more vigilant. And again, you know, not not to be a broken record about this. This is a major Republican theme, but we got to know who's coming into our country. We don't know who's in our country right now. And undoubtedly, as Marco Rubio says, if 1%, if one-tenth of 1% of the people that are coming into our country who are on the terror watch list, who are getting through, if one-tenth of 1% are terrorists, they can do massive amounts of damage. Should America offer to take some of the Gazan population? No, I think the Gazan population should go back to Gaza. I mean, I think this war will be over in six months. There'll be a rebuilding and they should go back, you know, to Gaza. And hopefully, you know, uh, I think a lot of them recognize how deserved they were by uh, by Hamas. And hopefully they'll go back to living within a, with a set of uh, protocols that's not threatening to Israel. Anthony Blinken has said that uh, he's hopeful that in the end of this conflict that the, the Gaza Strip could be handed over to the Palestinian Authority who had control of the Strip between uh, 2005 and 2007 after Israel's withdrawal and before Hamas took over. Um, and is also, it, it seems as though the administration is looking uh, to use this conflict as an opportunity to get Israel back on the track of a two-state solution. Do you think a two-state solution is at all possible at this stage? And would you give uh, control of the Gaza Strip over to the Palestinian Authority after this, knowing everything you know about the Palestinian Authority? Yeah, absolutely not. I mean, the Palestinian Authority, let's let's be clear about the Palestinian Authority. 
they are um, they are paying uh, terrorists to kill Jews. Uh, they are paying um, uh, Hamas terrorists who just killed Jews. It's part of their uh, part of their charter. Um, they have been rooting for Hamas. Uh, the um, uh, many uh, cities within um, Judea and Samaria, many of the Palestinian cities, are hotbeds of support for Hamas. Hamas is embedded there as well. Um, I, I believe a large portion of the population, both in Judea and Samaria and in Gaza, has been radicalized. And I don't see any way for Israel to live in peace in that region if it doesn't have, at the very least, uh, military control over, over both areas. And I think Israel's control over the Gaza Strip needs to increase, uh, not decrease. And I believe that, you know, in, in Judea and Samaria, I, I think ultimately Israeli sovereignty is the only path that will um, protect Israel. And it will also, I think, enable the Palestinian people to have a much better quality of life, much better commerce, education, healthcare, and the like. Again, without without you know uh, the Palestinians uh, participating in the you know national electoral process, which can't happen, you're not going to um, end up uh, destroying the Jewish state, the one and only Jewish state. But I think there is a pathway here to Israeli sovereignty over over this entire territory. That um, if if it's done properly over time, well planned with with help from Israel's allies. I think that is the only long-term solution. Um, if anything uh, at all, this uh, event of the last uh, last month taught us just how dangerous a two-state solution would be. David Friedman, former U.S. ambassador to the State of Israel, thank you so much for joining us. You know, thanks, Alex. Great to be with you.